scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ Every service is a campaign against ignorance to drive ignorance with an unbending determination from your life. Ignorance in every area. So you are equipped to, number one, be a spiritual man. Number two, you are equipped to be a king and priest in experience. You are equipped to be a blessing first to yourself and then through you to your world. If this is not happening, we are not in church. It doesn't matter what time and it doesn't matter what day. There are defined spiritual activities that must happen in a service for it to be called church. Just because believers are gathered and Jesus is mentioned there does not mean church happened. The church as an institution is the only authorized platform where the mind of God and the value system of the kingdom can be communicated. It is the most accurate platform where you learn God and learn his ways. Every other system outsources their knowledge from the church. The manual for this training is scripture. The course content doctrine. This is how believers grow. Hallelujah. But tonight's teaching is quite unique because um, yesterday we had, by the way, we had a wonderful moment with our family in Zaria all through the weekend. It was quite a wonderful time. Um, it's a great blessing to have connected with God's people again, just sharing, building, equipping God's people and the territory once again. And I returned. We had a wonderful time with our School of Ministry students. Um, we're preparing them for the final phase of their course so that they can write their exams and we look forward to their graduation. But then I returned back, you know, tired, stressed out, and while I had some time to just rest a little, excuse me, I had a dream. Pay attention, my sermon has started. I had a dream, and in that dream, I was back with the students in class again. We're, we're on the last course now, finance. And when I had a dream, in that dream I was teaching the students, but a strange thing began to happen. Same scenario as it happened in real life. I noticed that the doors to the class just opened and people started coming who were not students of the school of ministry. They came and they sat down and I didn't seem bothered. In fact, I was excited. Then they came then they came, and while they were coming again, they were inviting others to come and hear. Some of them were shouting. You know how people shout when they are enjoying themselves in church? And people were coming, coming, and the scene started changing to look like the koinonia meeting. I knew exactly what God was saying. Exactly what God was saying. That he wanted me to communicate some of these ideas that we were teaching in the class and to bring them here and so in obedience like apostle paul i would not be negligent to this heavenly calling and so tonight join me as we explore the mysteries of the kingdom in a two-part series that i hope to start today and finish next week the power to get wealth part one we are going to be exploring by the spirit the economic system of the kingdom 
as revealed from scripture, as, as revealed from the lives of uncommon people, men and women who have so labored and paid the price in the kingdom and even extending to the secular environment. Um, I do not intend to make this unnecessarily comprehensive because I know that we will have a number of um, other teachings and series that will come. When you are teaching complicated subjects like this, it is wise and better to teach them not only in series but in levels, line upon line. Are we together now? Yes. From, from an educational standpoint, when you bring too much information for people, they may be excited but they may not necessarily be transformed by it so the church is also a place of learning we're in the school of the spirit but i pray in the name of jesus that this that i will share with us tonight will truly truly bless us hallelujah at the end of it we're going to just make declarations over ourselves now the subject of uh, economy and wealth and finance is is one that is quite a touchy subject as far as the church is concerned because there are usually two schools of thought or two dimensions of approach to it number one we have those who completely ignore the subject of the empowerment of believers all wise but especially in the area of finances because probably they may have received a, an understanding from largely well-meaning preachers who may have trivialized the need for economic empowerment in the body in a bid to emphasize other topics like holiness to emphasize other topics like righteousness godliness the love for god and the fear of the lord which is very profitable we may have downplayed on um additionally important subjects like the economic empowerment of the saints the result is what we continue to experience across africa across our nation and sadly even within the church are we together yes then we have the other side of the pendulum men and women who approach the subject of wealth and empowerment financial empowerment as though that is the only thing jesus taught and that imbalance has manufactured all shades of carnality, theft, insincerity, lack of integrity, etc. They have been a derivative of that imbalance. So the entire scope of the believer's education from this lopsided standpoint becomes money, 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 money. On a crusade ground, money. In a discipleship class, money even while repenting money everything that has to money and so you see that there have been two sides of the imbalance and both of them are equally destructive because ignorance will keep you poor and poverty will make you a slave and slavery will frustrate you you will die and sadly it takes you to hell so we have not we are yet to find any profit in approaching life from this standpoint ignoring the blessings that come with being empowered even financially on the other hand there are people who have lost god they have lost everything faith because of this mundane pursuit for money from an unscriptural standpoint and the only reward they get for approaching it this way is sorrow upon sorrow that depresses them then they become the echo of solomon's proclamation vanity upon vanity all is vanity solomon got punished for his foolishness for us to learn he says the things that are written aforetime they are for our learning so that we through the comfort of scripture might find hope we do not need to make that mistake again the issue is not economic empowerment the issue is the approach so i hope by the spirit of the living god to from first a spiritual standpoint and then leaning on the shoulders of those who have been graced in this area with proven track records i hope that we'll be able to put together principles that will help us it is my belief that at the end of this teaching there will be remarkable transformations and testimonies from the lives of people if this is a deliverance service a proper deliverance service this is not a financial seminar at all this is a deliverance service 
Proverbs 22 from verse 2. We'll read four scriptures and then I'll begin to share a few things. Are we together? Proverbs 22 verse 2. Ready to read? If you're a believer and you love Jesus, please read as loud as you can. One to read. The rich and poor meet together. One more time. Very dangerous statement that the rich and the poor meet together. Where? On earth. The platform that brings the rich and the poor together is the earth. And then the Bible says something that if you do not understand, it makes God look like an unfair person. He says, the Lord is the maker of them. Who are the them? The rich and the poor. Now listen, God did not make them rich or poor. God made them men. They separated themselves into rich or poor. There is no record of God making rich people and poor people from scripture. God made men. Men now gravitated into different dimensions, economically speaking. And the Bible says, whichever one you choose, one fact remains. God is the maker of them all. He didn't make them so, he made them all. Verse 7, same scripture, Proverbs 22 and verse 7. This is a very disturbing scripture. Very, very disturbing scripture. Let's try it now, please. One to read. Hmm. Please, one more time. The rich. He didn't say the rich Christian. He didn't say the rich believer. The rich, anyone will rule over the poor, anyone. And whoever is at the other side of borrowing, the Bible says he will remain servant to the lender. The rich continent will rule over the poor continent. The rich nation will rule over the poor nation. The rich community will rule over the poor community. The rich individual. So there is a relationship between wealth and dominion. Please pay attention. Very instructive statement. Ready for the second one? Proverbs chapter, Psalms 35 and verse 27. Psalms 35. Please let's hurry up so I begin to teach. Again, if we can read, I'll appreciate. Ready? It's projected. One to read. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. With heart's pleasure in the prosperity. So straight up without any confusion. We know according to scripture. That God has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 6. Genesis 17 and verse 6. 17 and 6. 17 and verse 6. Please read it as a prophecy over your life, over your family and all who are under your care. Ready? One to read. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Please say amen. amen. Can you take a few more scriptures? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Apostle Paul is teaching the church in Corinth. He's putting perspectives to a lot of confusion that was happening at the time with the church in Corinth. It was at a time, theologically speaking, where they were having an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and there was a lot that was going on. So he came to bring apostolic order. The entire theme of Corinthians is that all things be done decently and in order. So he needed to define a lot of things and to put things in perspective. Now he comes to the subject of abundance and here's what he had to say. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich.
Let's read one more. This is a story. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. First and foremost, may it never happen to you. Say amen. amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Because what you are about to read is not a very good story. But it's very, very instructive. Start from verse 13, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 13. Just a little with the volume. This wisdom have I seen under the sun. And it seemed great unto me. What is the wisdom? Are you ready? I'll read and when I desire you to join me, I'll just prompt you. Please do. There was a little city. Look at the story now. And a few men within it. And there came a great king against that city. And he beside that city. And he built great bulwarks against it. Verse 15. Please read with me. One to read. Now, there was found in it a poor wise man. What sort of a description is that? Didn't the mother give him a name? Why didn't the Bible just say he found Joshua or he found David? When the Bible becomes this descriptive, it means God is leading you somewhere. He, there was found in it a poor wise man. Uh -huh. And he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered the same poor man. The lesson, next verse. Please keep reading. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, a poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not here. That's why I said, may it never happen to you. That if you need a voice to advocate the purposes of God, he's saying that wisdom is powerful. But that when wisdom and poverty goes hand in hand, Wisdom will go and leave you poor and your voice will not be heard. Now, please look up. Why has the subject of wealth and prosperity in the kingdom become such a burden? Did you know that I will not be surprised that as I am teaching this now, there are many of you listening, watching, and following who may be so uncomfortable. Why is he having to teach about money? I mean, there are many other spiritual things we need to talk about. I agree with you and I sympathize with you. That's why God sent me. Because there has to be a correction of this ideology. The lopsidedness, the belief that the moment you begin to talk about economy, I will tell you why many people have not been serious about the subject of finance from a kingdom standpoint. The reason is because most of them have other people who are paying the price of their ignorance for them, financially speaking. So whether you understand the principles or not, there seems to be someone you can lean on and tap into his own sacrifice. And you see, there is something about pain that is a blessing i was teaching the school of ministry students the prodigal son was not told by the holy spirit to come to himself pain in that place reminded him and the bible says he came to himself there are many people who will not pay attention to their finances because every time God wants to teach them that lesson, here comes someone in the guise of compassion and will stop them from seeing the relevance of understanding that subject. Now, the terrible thing is that the moment you get to a point where you become comfortable with poverty and lack and ignorance, you are not the only one who will suffer it. The average person seated here is connected to at least four people. If you're a family person, you have children, nuclear, and extended family members all together. And can I tell you, the kind of trouble that is in our nation today, in Africa today, is not just a problem with government. It's a problem with orientation. The, the, there has to be an overhaul of our orientation, especially in the church. 
There are many people, like I said earlier, who talk about money from a carnal standpoint. Even when they are sleeping, when you wave money, they will wake up. That lust, that lust and that drive for it. They can kill for money. They can do anything for money. Please do not confuse what I'm teaching tonight. That is not at all what I'm talking about. Number two, I am not talking about this marketing of flesh and lust that ignores Jesus just for the pursuit of mundane things to prove poverty that I am rich, I am this. That is also not what I'm talking about. My communication is from a kingdom standpoint with the understanding that the men and the women who are listening are people who are determined to see Jesus revealed and Jesus glorified. If so, then we can continue. I can't take for granted that all of us are in the same page. For many of you, I'm not continuing what you have been learning. It is a deliverance from what you might have been learning. Are we together? Yes. Because there are people who God is already dealing with in the area of lust for material things, lust for money. And so chances are that when you hear these kinds of teaching, you become excited because you think it's, it's just giving allowance to that level of carnality. This is at all not what I'm saying. However, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, I would be a wicked man of God to number one in ignore the instruction of the Holy Spirit and then to not capture this reality in your experience. How else will you excel in a world that is driven by economy? In ignorance. No. From joblessness to terrorism to moral decadence, most of these things have a direct connection to lack or insufficiency of financial resources. There are many people today, I don't mean to get you emotional, but there are many people today who died before their time. And the limitation was that they did not have the economic resources to have simply helped people who had certain levels of sicknesses whose cure could be, I mean, had been discovered and it would have been managed scientifically. There are many children today who were born to be prophets. There are many people who we would have been contemporaries in ministry serving the purposes of God. But an economic disadvantage brought them down. Some of them is now they are trying to school. Is now they are trying to get their left from their right. Can I tell you, when you look at the subject of insufficiency, from the negative effect it has caused you, society, and the kingdom of God, now you are motivated by a correct desire to be blessed. Are we together? I have videos and videos that are sent to me every once and again of probably terrorists that were caught. And you see young boys, teenagers, and you ask those boys how much was given to them to cause the kind of mayhem. Ranging from 200 naira to 10,000 naira is what will cause an irrecoverable damage to a family. And yet we say it does not matter. Many people today have been relocated out of the will of God in pursuit for money. There are times when the devil wants to destroy you, he gives you visa. And you go like Jonah, out of the will of God. And many have been victims of that. And we have the audacity to condemn and point accusing fingers at people. Can I tell you this? You have no moral stance to condemn anybody you did not give an opportunity to learn the truth. Our young men and our young women will continue to be casualties in society until men and women are of God especially are unashamed to stand up and bridge this gap. We are contributors to nation building. And we are communicating this teaching in a way that anybody, this teaching tonight is not for Christians. This teaching is for everybody loved by God. Coming from a Christian perspective. But it's applicable because the truths are irrefutable. They are not opinions. God is the God of all flesh. So let me tell you sincerely. For as long as there are only few blessed people in the body of Christ. We will overburden them. And the devil, we, they will remain instruments of attack. Because when the devil knows that one million people are depending on one person. Instead of looking for the one million people to destroy them, he will strike that one, one person and render a lot of people helpless and homeless. 
Many people today continue to go to their grave in pain, dying of heart attack and dying of all kinds of things because of economic hardship. From malnutrition in the northeast and across the north here in Nigeria to all versions of things, you find people who cannot go to school because of 10,000, 5,000, 20,000 and we are here jumping in the church saying we are the light of the world. We are jumping and saying we are the salt of the earth. And when the world says we are lying, we try to fight them. Where is the proof? If you are a witness, there has to be an evidence. Can I tell you the truth? The evidence is not 30 cars. The evidence is not infinite mansions scattered around. The evidence is not billions piling up in a bank account. No. No. That is not the evidence. The evidence is not demanding respect on account of your economic pedigree. No. This is not what God taught us. We are ambassadors. So please join me and let's explore the principles of the kingdom. Now that we have been able to set this foundation, why does God want us to prosper? Let me just start from there. We have to answer the question, why? Why gives purpose and perspective to everything? If we do not know why God blesses us in the kingdom and why he so desires to give us the power to get wealth, the power to prosper, there will keep being casualties from people who are blessed. There are many people who started in church today, they are not in church. They started loving God the moment they became economically comfortable. They threw God away, threw everything godliness away. So why does God bless us? Tonight, I'll introduce everybody to a bit of what we learn in our school of ministry. My dear people, school of ministry, please allow me as I take a few extracts from your course content. This is God speaking. Number one, the first reason why God blesses us in this kingdom is that he desires for us to live a comfortable life. Anything that rejects that statement is demonic. If there is anything in your spirit trying to fight what I just said, I want you to know that is the voice of the devil. God desires for us to live a comfortable life. Now, economically speaking, there are four realms of living. Economically speaking. The first realm is called survival. It's a dangerous realm to be in. The second realm is called comfort. The third realm is called luxury. The last realm is called extravagance. Let me repeat myself one more time, please. That economically speaking, there are four realms of living. The first realm is called survival. A realm of poverty, lack, insufficiency, always worrying about money, stealing, manipulating, doing all kinds of things. Then there is the realm of comfort, where your needs are met without options. Then there is the realm of luxury. Then there is the realm of extravagance. Now, we are kingdom people, so our communication is from a kingdom perspective. The lowest realm and that highest realm is not for you. We are not called to a life of survival and we are not called to a life of extravagance. These two realms are dangerous. If you find yourself in a realm of survival, fight it like you fight Satan. When you find yourself in a realm of extravagance, you are losing the consciousness of your stewardship. The allowance for the believer is the realm of comfort and at best luxury. When the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain, contentment resides within that realm. Are we learning already? So why does God bless us in the kingdom? Number one, so that we can live a comfortable life. God wants us to live a comfortable life. God wants you to not have a problem paying your children's school fees. God does not want a husband and wife jamming their head together after praying three hours, fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. A devil, a demon cheaply comes in between them to cause trouble using economic ties. God wants us to live meaningful lives. There are many people who sit in church and while a message is going on, they are thinking about the house rent. Every call that comes, you refuse to pick it because you hope, you think it might be your landlord, you are ready. You, you, you cannot live and be productive under that kind of environment and mental condition. 
So he desires that we live a comfortable life. Number two, why does God bless us in the kingdom? The second reason why God blesses us in the kingdom is so that we can help provide financial resources for kingdom advance. Never forget this. So that we can provide financial resources for kingdom advance. I teach the school of ministry students that, do you know, and, and I say this with every sense of respect and regard to the body of Christ, first appreciating all that we are and all that God has done and is doing in us thus far. But I have to say this, most of the manipulations that we talk about in church, whether from women of God and, you know, people, all kinds of things, pressure that is put on people over the subject of finances. Can I tell you, when believers are mentored properly, in their building process, they should be taught that it is part of your kingdom responsibility to provide financial resources for kingdom advance. It should not be anything that comes as a manipulation. There should not be anything superstitious about it. The ark was carried on the shoulder of priests. It will always take men to provide financial resources for kingdom advance. But not by manipulation, nor coercion. It is by revelation, motivated by their love for Jesus. Are we learning now? That means if you are seated here, looking at me, and listening and following online, and you cannot point your resources being channeled, a part of your resources being channeled for kingdom activities... And let me define if you want what kingdom activities are. Kingdom activities any, refer to any activity that ultimately leads to the revelation of Jesus and the glorification of the same. It qualifies to be called a kingdom activity. Whether it's a sermon, whether it's a crusade, whether it's a school. If kingdom come is not captured in that agenda, it is not of God and it is not worth your investment. Are we together tonight? So God desires that as he blesses me, as he increases me, as he prospers me, a part of that resource, a, without coercion, I should love his house and love his work so much that I should be an active contributor to kingdom come. Number three, why does God bless us in this kingdom? The third reason why God blesses us in this kingdom is so that we can reveal the love and the compassion of Jesus to a dying world in a practical and a definite way. One more time, please. So that we can reveal the love and the compassion of Jesus to a dying world in a practical and a definite way. To reveal the love of Jesus to a dying world in a practical and a definite way. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples when you have love. Not just when you pray in tongues. The love component is very powerful. There is a dimension of evangelism called evangelism through love. That the love is the preacher. And he preaches so well. Any tribe, any tongue at all. There are people today who may never be able to help themselves. There are children today who may never have access to quality health care, access to schools, until you respond to that call. Can I tell you this? Every blessed person has a responsibility by God and under God that a portion of your resources should go into blessing people without any bias for religion or whatever kind of prejudice. You extend the love of Jesus to people and allow the love to be a preacher. These are the three principal reasons why God blesses us financially in the kingdom. A recap one last time. Number one, to live a comfortable life. Number two, to contribute to making financial resources available for kingdom advance and then number three so you see that number one has to do with you number two has to do with the church number three has to do with the world number one has to do with you your personal comfort you means you and everybody around you number two has to do with the church for you 
his idea is your comfort. For the church, his idea is kingdom come, the edification of the saints. For the world, his idea is the revelation of Jesus as love. Can I be honest with you? Have you seen people commit suicide who were wealthy? It then tells you that money in itself does not give you satisfaction and fulfillment. The satisfaction and fulfillment comes when you know that it has helped you live a comfortable life. That it has helped you to be able to bring financial resources for the building of the Lord's house. And then to be able to reveal the love of Jesus. Let me add by saying this. From a standpoint of assignment, from a standpoint of assignment, money in a man's life really only does two things. Number one, time redemption. From a standpoint of assignment, the first assignment of money in your life is to help you redeem time. These are very interesting concepts. Why is time redemption important? Because that is really what you have. Every other thing you have is a subject of time. You can lose money and get it back. A business can go down flat and you can build it up again. But when you lose time, time is precious. Ask a dying man, what is your wish? He's not going to tell you, build me an estate quickly. He's not going to tell you, please give me more degrees. The wish of a dying man is more time. Isaiah 38. That was the cry of Hezekiah. He was already a wealthy and a blessed man. But when you lose time, everything that came through time is also lost. Can I be honest with you? You have to understand this. This is really the theology of money. Money is a mechanism that helps us to redeem time. So, if it will take you one hour to take transport maybe from a, the, a park to a particular place to get to where you need to get to and do whatever you have to do. If God grants you the opportunity to buy a car, what is that car doing to you? That car has now come as a system of advantage to your life to help you redeem time. Are you getting the idea now? Yes. If money is not used in your life to redeem time, you don't know the use for it. I'm sorry to be harsh. I don't mean to. But this is the truth. Many people really do not know the assignment of money to them. Money is a powerful mechanism for time redemption. You can redeem time. You can redeem time. Number two, from a standpoint of assignment, what does it do to you? Money is a mechanism for efficiency. This is really the assignment of money to you. Time redemption and efficiency. Question. When you move from one small room to a three-bedroom flat, does it add your size? Do you have to necessarily buy a bigger bed and put it in all the room? But it provides a greater platform for efficiency. Is that true? If you are in one room, I don't mean to insult you, forgive me please, but your kitchen is right there. Is that true? There are other rooms that part of it is even a bathroom and all kinds of things. So there is no efficiency. Now when God gives you an opportunity to move to a bigger house where you probably do not have neighbors at close proximity, it grants you access to privacy. All these things together spell efficiency. So when God blesses you, the assignment of money is to help you redeem time and then to make you efficient. If it takes you 13 hours or 12 hours under normal circumstances to live from where you are to say a part of the nation like Lagos and you can take flight by paying more, sadly. You see that? And in 50 minutes you are there. What have you done? You have redeemed time, but also you have helped efficiency. Is that true? You can trek to Lagos. You can use a bike to get to Lagos. You can go by road. The difference is how you will arrive. Is that true? Efficiency. Listen, listen. Do you know why efficiency is important? Because it is your responsibility to provide, to keep this body alive. This body you see is your authorization to keep functioning on earth. Whatever deteriorates this body beyond a certain level, the spirit will not be able to coexist again. It will leave. 
So you have a responsibility to keep this body alive and strong so that you can serve the purposes of God. Hence, the need for efficiency. Are you blessed tonight? So next time you see money on your hand, you get an alert, my precious people who got all, all kinds of miracle alerts. You see how God is helping you to preserve what he has given you. If you do not understand the purpose of money, Satan will give you another reason. Efficiency and time redemption is its assignment to you. So every time you pray and say, Lord, help me redeem time. When the Bible says redeem the time, part of that advice means be wealthy. Because if you are wealthy, you are able to redeem the time. It is true. And then to be efficient. Has God spoken to us? Three foundational truths about wealth and the blessings of God. And then we'll just share a few principles. Have you been blessed so far? Now, when it has to do with the subject of the blessing of the Lord in this kingdom, remember what we are discussing, the power to get wealth, part one. There are three foundational truths that you must have at the back of your mind even before we begin to discuss the principles of the kingdom. Number one, please write this down, start it if you can. Number one, never forget this as far as your journey to attaining kingdom wealth is concerned. There is the difference between kingdom wealth and wealth. The difference is the presence of the kingdom. Write this down, please. All blessings come from God and belong to God. This is the first foundational understanding every believer must have. It's like a rule of thumb. All blessings come from God and belong to God. All blessings, including finances. All blessings. I may not want to go into the various levels of prosperity to discuss with you. I just, I just felt guilty that I didn't talk about that. Would you let me one minute, let me just chip that in. Uh, that there are really five levels of prosperity. The word prosperity comes from the word prosper. It simply means to do well. It has nothing to do with money. The word prosperity is an attempt to describe someone who is advancing and making progress. When you are excelling, you are making progress, it is said that you are prospering. We connect it to money today, but it does not necessarily have anything to do with money. And there are five levels of prosperity. In this kingdom, when, it, when you say you have prospered, it has to be five over five. Number one, spiritual prosperity. That is the highest level of prosperity given to the believer. Spiritual prosperity. What does that mean? Being born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, learning the ways of God, and loving Jesus with all your heart. Spiritual prosperity. For time, let me rush number two. The second level of prosperity is called mental prosperity. Have you blessed a madman if you give him one billion in his mad state? What is wrong? The money or him? That means a man is mad and then you drop one billion. He needs to be alive. What does it mean to be mentally prosperous? It means to be developed, to outsource superior belief systems. Belief systems about God, belief systems about life. Your ideologies, your philosophies, your belief systems line up with scripture. That you get to a point where you, you are enlightened, superior belief systems. And now you can deploy the creativity of your mind for the betterment of your own life. Because the Bible says, for as he thinketh in his heart, interchange for mind, he says, so he is. The second level of prosperity is the extent of your mental development. It is often said that you can never rise beyond the frame of your mindset. That is so true. I've done the teaching here. Mindsets are doorways. Mindsets are belief systems. Is that true? Yes. That your mindset is the authorized channel for God and even for Satan to access your life. Your mindset. When your belief system is faulty, almost nothing can bless you. Mental 
Many years ago, I was teaching along these lines in, in Zaria, and I gave a very instructive example. How many of you have seen individuals who can use a shirt, say a white shirt, for over a year or two, and it will still be looking new? Have you seen people like that? They are that meticulous. And then you just give that shirt as a gift to someone. And in two weeks, his mindset is written on the shirt. Are you seeing that now? What changed? The mindset. Everything around you is a report card. It tells us the health of your mindset or otherwise. The availability of financial resources, your relationships, etc. All those things are mere report cards. They are telling us the level and the extent of your mental transition. And can I be honest with you? If you want to be global in your approach, if you want to be able to do much for the kingdom, you must find a way of divorcing yourself from unhealthy beliefs. Beliefs that have come through culture, beliefs that have come through your failure of the past, beliefs that have come through your past experiences, beliefs that have come through negative associations, beliefs that have come through all kinds of negative exposure. You must obtain grace from God to rid yourself of those things. Psalm 78 and verse 41, a very instructive scripture that talks about the limiting power of a wrong mindset. Yea, they turned back and tempted God. They limited the Holy One of Israel. How could a man limit God? Yet the Bible says it here, that the nation of Israel limited God. A journey of 40 years or 40 days became 40 years because you limited God. If God says yes and your mindset says no, yes will remain in the realm of the spirit and never manifest. Are we together? The third level of prosperity is called bodily prosperity. That means your health and your well-being. Africans, even though we thank God there is, there is a gradual health renaissance that is happening in Africa right now. People are becoming a lot more concerned. And thank God for all the people who are doctors here and those who are in the whole wellness industry who are bringing to our consciousness the fact that we have been eating death in the pot for many years. The sons of the prophet said there is death in the pot. Hallelujah. Most people have eaten themselves to their grave and God is granting us grace. There is a, a, there is a health revival. People are now more conscious. They exercise, they eat, they drink water and they watch what kind of water they drink and all of this. And that is very profitable. But let me tell you sincerely, you want to keep this body as long as possible so that it will help you serve the purposes of God. If you deteriorate this body through carelessness, you will go to heaven, but you may not finish your assignment. Are we together now? A body has thou prepared for me. Maybe this is a word from God to someone. Africans interpret prosperity as extravagance in eating. And you know, generally when you come from a background of deprivation, when God blesses you, you are on a revenge mission. Now, I don't mean to insult you, but it's true. So people can sit down and take two bottles of Coca-Cola, half chicken, only you, with three or four wraps of swallow. And once you eat that, we, 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 have been, we have been given a narrative that that kind of scenario equals prosperity. But it may not be so. The Bible says the leaves are for the healing of the nations. I leave that for you to unravel. But believe me. If you find any doctor who knows about health, make him your friend. And ask him honestly for an advice. Am I dying or living? And do not be offended when he examines you and says, I think you need to change this, that, or that. Three years in a row, I had my retreat and I found out that the lowest performing area in my life was my health. I said, no more. I'm going to repent before God and pay attention. Because this body needs to be used to go to the nations and preach the gospel. And then one of the fathers of faith, after preaching in a conference, one of our fathers of faith drew me to his office and he said, My son, let me talk to you. He said, Be careful. Africans kill their prophets. Watch your health. I took that as a voice from God. And as I received it, as hot as it came, I'm transferring it to you. Please... 
learn it today. Go online, healthy, uh, healthy, healthy, healthy eating or healthy diet, enter and settle down. Let the spirit of wisdom help you. Are we together? There are people who are practically dead. They, are, they don't receive. You are talking. They are sleepy. You see, all these, these things are effects. They, they, there is an if You need to prosper in your body. Number four, financial prosperity. Are you saying that there are four levels now? Spiritual prosperity, mental prosperity, bodily prosperity, your health and well-being, and then financial prosperity so you see that what we have called prosperity is only one of the many dimensions of prosperity what does it mean to prosper financially it means to sustain the ability to totally conquer poverty lack and the negative effects that come with them can i be honest with you it is important for you to be productive to have sufficient financial resources when needed there is timing to prosperity. If money comes too late, it will destroy you because it's supposed to come when needed to help you solve the problem. Are we together? And then finally, the last dimension of prosperity is called relational prosperity. The health of your relationships. That God blesses you with strategic destiny relationships that give you an opportunity to express love an opportunity to care, to connect with people, and to live a meaningful and a productive life. Because by and large, when all is said and done, it is relationships that will be the last man standing. First, your relationship with Jesus, your relationship with family, your relationship with useful people around you. Do not neglect relationship in a bid to pursue money. Many people have thrown away strategic destiny helpers because they are looking for money. By the time they find it, they are now lonely. They turn left and right. They threw away their family members. They threw away the Holy Ghost. Threw away everything. Finally, they got the money because whoever seeks finds. And then they find it. Kill everybody on earth, for instance. And leave all the banks open. What will you do with the money? Money is only valuable because there are men at the other side to receive it. Never forget that. So you cannot exalt papers and, and cards and all kinds of things more than men. That means if you are the only person of the over 7.6 billion people who are on earth today, if everyone suddenly falls asleep and does not wake up, and all the banks are open. There's no thief to harass you. There's no terrorist to bomb you. You can enter any bank and find the box rooms and the safes open. What will you do with the money? The money itself is not useful. It is only useful because of what it does to men. So do not ignore men. At the end of your life, it is not papers that will bury you. At the end of your life, papers will not walk their way and get a coffin and give you a befitting barrier. No. In fact, at the end of your life, you will not buy your way to heaven. It is your relationship. That relational prosperity is what will take you to heaven. Even if you go to hell, it's still relational prosperity that will take you to hell. Either ways. Relationships are powerful. Everything money can buy, relationships can buy you too. So let's return back to the three fundamental things that I was trying to say. Number one, all blessings come from God and belong to God. It's a fundamental rule about kingdom wealth you must know. James chapter 1, please, and verse 17. Let's hurry up. James chapter 1 and verse 17. Thank you, Jesus. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Everybody say from above. Above is certainly not hellfire, from above. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. So that there is no confusion and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So if you ever see anything good, including the availability of financial resources, favor, blessings, everything that constitutes a system of advantage to the believer, and to mankind generally, it comes from above. 
The first rule you have to understand about kingdom wealth is all blessings come from God and belong to Him. The emphasis is belong to Him. That means in this kingdom, owners are rebels. We do not own things. We are stewards. Please, you have to understand this. My money, that is the language of people who are about to crash. It all belongs to you. Oh, it all belongs to you. It all belongs to you. Oh, I will tell you why many people do not secure the support of God. There is this pride that we have. My money. All blessings come from God and belong to Him. If God gives you a house, if God gives you a position, if God gives you intellectual soundness, if God gives you ability, anytime you see your bank balance, I want you to know that it's only the text that came from your bank. That ability came from God. All blessings come from God. Therefore, no matter how I rise, no matter how blessed I am, I should never be ashamed to go down on my knees. Even with the designer that you are wearing, even with the jeep packed, even with all of the names, you can go down on your knees and tell your world, your business partners and everyone, I don't know where you got yours, but my help cometh from the Lord. Listen to me. We need to train believers to get to a point where they become vocally unashamed about letting the world know where their wealth come from, came from. It came from Jesus. All blessings come from God. Next time you go to your house and you see an award hanging there, next time you receive an alert, next time you look at yourself and you see that you are in a big house, a big mansion, please do not allow naysayers alongside psychophants flatter you into believing that it was a making of your own. Rule number one, if you want to do financial business with God, you have to understand that all blessings come from God and belong to Him. So if someone calls you and says, CEO, we are waiting for you, and you say, I'm talking to God. If he dare says you are wasting time, educate him and say, Before, when I was at the backside of the mountain, when nobody knew me, this same hand that picked me is the same hand I remain loyal to, even in the midst of the plenty. Can I tell you this? We live in a world that will bully you into looking stupid for loving God in the presence of wealth. You are in a place and your phone rings and it's a worship song. You quickly off it because you are embarrassed. You don't want to fall your hand. All blessings come from God and belong to Him. So if God says transfer $5,000, transfer 1 million naira, you don't sit down binding and casting the voice, acting as if you don't know it's God. Because it belongs to him. This was the mistake of the rich fool. He forgot that he was only steward. In this kingdom, owners are rebels. We are not given ownership. Now, of course, I know you say ownership to mean responsibility. You are right. So that you don't insult anyone you hear saying we are owners. I'm giving us a word of caution now. You will hear people in the finance say, oh, you are an owner. Understand what they mean. Within the context of what I'm teaching, everything... God gives you belongs to Him. Yeshua Hamashiach. Yeshua Hamashiach. Parents, repent from telling children, this is my thing. This is my house. Let me tell you, there is a burden that owners have that you don't have the power to carry. Owners must maintain the well-being of everything that is their own. 
when God becomes owner, he also becomes Abba, protector, source, defender. This is why we have a lot of balloon success. People go up and come down because they do not know that there is only one called Abba. All blessings come from God and belong to God. Please, when you are teaching people about wealth, don't just jump to business. You see, we've not even spoken about business. Leave that one. We've not even spoken about a job or any of these things. This is the, the belief system is what must be corrected first. So as I go to work, the moment I receive my salary or my business makes profit or whatever it is, I am conscious of the fact that what has come to me now is from God and belongs to God. Rule number two. Please write it down. Are you ready? All blessings come from God, comma, through men to men. The second foundational rule for understanding kingdom wealth. That all blessings come from God through men to men. It does not come from God to men. It comes from God through men to men. Are we together now? Yeah. You have to understand it. Can I have maybe two or three gentlemen, the protocol, let's, let's use the protocol guys or anybody at all, anyone or maybe my, my dear people, come. Three of you, please come. Anyone, any three of you. Don't worry, sir. Please come. Watch this. Stand here. Let me just use this as an example. Please you stand here. Please stand here. Please stand there. This guy is so well suited. Let him be God. <laughs> I'm not saying God wears suit. He clothes himself in light. No, you stand here. Watch this. This is the final recipient. This is what he wants. Blessing, prosperity, increase, breakthrough, whatever it is. God desires to get it to him. But the way that he does is to pass through men. So you need two entities for the arrival of anything. God and the men that will allow him pass through. If God says yes and this man says no, your blessing will remain there. Now, most believers do not know this. We have all kinds of immature statements like, all I need is just God. If you mean that in terms of his sovereignty, you are right. If you mean that in terms of the dynamics of transfer, you are joking. It is the spirit and the bride that says come. If the spirit says come and there is no bride to echo come, nothing will come for you. The spirit and the bride says come. So here we are again. Look up. This is you. Oh God, open doors for me. And he says amen. Here is the open door. Oh God, wipe the tears of my family. Are we together? All blessings come from God through man to man. Your job from God through man to man. The prayer point that you dropped here during miracle service. From God through man to man. Even your salvation from God through man. How can they hear except there be a preacher? God is the word. But John the Baptist was the word, the voice. Are we together now? This is the second fundamental rule. You have to know this. So when you are praying, you don't only pray for God alone. You pray for men. And then you must master like you will be learning. Because if this man does not like you, and yet he's the one who will receive it from God, you are in trouble. When a man's ways pleases the Lord, there are men that are not castable. They are gatekeepers. God will grant you favor because they are the ones midwifing your blessings. So, God gives this man, please take. And now, you see that it has left God. But has it reached him? This is where many people are. You say, God, give me. say, no, no, no. I've answered you since. I answered you since January. So, what is the limitation? 
all blessings because you do not know this is why we teach things like the ministry of destiny help us this is why we teach you the systems of advantage in the kingdom that connect you to the blessings of god this is why we teach you things like law of honor now watch this this man has this blessing already from god this man's prayer has been answered but if this man dishonors this destiny helper this honor is the key that closes the door for access he can remain five years it left heaven five years ago but it never got to you because the man who will be used by god and yes can i tell you the truth i'm going to say something that will surprise you now there are times that god has already blessed this man when you pray to him he will say there's no need there is enough of this already in the hand of a man just connect to a man who will give you there is no amount of money that is going to come from the windows of heaven every currency is in somebody's bank account right now every job is with somebody right now one person's signature please help this person and the person will say it's not the english who are speaking i have a relationship i want to tell you something very sincere when god moved me to this city i was telling the dear students yesterday i found out i may be wrong i'm not speaking as a statistician i'm speaking as somebody who used common sense to analyze can i be honest with you i found out that over 50 60 percent of the pathway to wealth in abuja works by relationships if you i may be wrong can I be honest with you? I have taught you this. In this kingdom, who hates you does not matter. But who likes you? Second law. All blessings come from God through man to man. All troubles come from Satan through man to man. Whether it is God walking or Satan walking, men will be in between. So whilst you are praying, I'm not only teaching you the principles that help you receive from God. You must know what to do in this world of men. Because this world of men is a mysterious world. The heaven of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth has he given to the sons of men. If you don't know what to do with men, you will suffer as if God didn't answer your prayer. Like many sincere people are suffering today. The, the lifting power of men that when men a man steps into your life he can be used by god to change the entire financial climate in a moment i can tell you this there are ministries that were shifted in one moment because the right person came there are destinies that were destroyed because the wrong person came Whilst you're seated, I'd like you to pray this second rule. Lord, now that I know that all blessings come through men, I ask that you move these men to my life. Go ahead and pray. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We've not even started discussing the principles. These are just foundational thoughts. That number one, all blessings come from God and belong to Him. All blessings. Every financial resource, every lifting comes from God and belongs to Him. Then number two, all blessings come from God, but it reaches you from men to men. Through men, I meant to say. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. A scripture to back that statement. The Bible says give. It didn't say give money. Give anything. And it shall be given to you. Give wickedness, it shall be given to you. Give kindness, it shall be given to you. Give mercy, it shall be given to you. And it says it will be given in good measure. Pressed down, shaken together and running over shall, shall, shall. So everything, it is God that gives it. But the conduits are men. When I found this as a revelation, it changed my life. That this is the world of men. Men really matter. Number three. Three foundational rules. Are you ready? Wealth and abundance in this kingdom is not an achievement. It is a trust from God. 
Wealth and abundance in this kingdom is not an achievement. Semicolon. It is a trust from God. Deuteronomy chapter 8, please give us verse 17 and 18. Wealth and abundance in this kingdom. These are three foundational pillars that you must never forget for as long as you're on earth. Learn them. Recite them. Teach your children. Teach the people in your company if it's a Christian organization. Or if it's an organization that is driven by Christian values. Let them know. That all blessings come from God and belong to Him. Number two, that all blessings come from God, but they reach you through men to you. Number three, that wealth and abundance in this kingdom is not an achievement. It is a trust from God. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 17. Here's what the Bible says. When you read from verse 15, it tells you that, or verse 13, it says, do not get to a point where when you have built houses and built cars and, and built all these things and you have all these estates, that your heart will be lifted and you will say to yourself, now verse 17, and thou shalt say in thy heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Then 18, but thou shalt remember. It means you can forget. Money is a cleaner. It can wipe memories. It should wipe the wrong one, but there are certain memories it should not wipe. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth. I will define it before. I will define what is the power to get wealth before we wrap up church today. Wealth and abundance in this kingdom is not an achievement. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11. Still buttressing on this third point. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Now, ordinarily speaking, all those things he's saying should naturally lead to the results. Are we together now? Yes. If it has to do with racing, the swift is who should win. If it has to do with battle, the strong is who should win. If it has to do with bread, the wise is who should have the bread. If it has to do with riches, it is understanding that should bring it. If it has to do with favor, skill, good understanding. But it says there have been occasions where everybody had those things and still did not have the result. Psalms 127, popular Psalm and verse 1. Psalms 127. God is helping us. Psalms 127, please. And verse 1. Except the Lord builds a house. When you read this from Amplified, it adds a lot of other things. It doesn't just say a, a house, a home, a destiny. Except the Lord builds a house. Is it Amplified? I think one of the versions. It says... They labor in vain that build it. Then he says, except the Lord watches or keeps a city, the watchmen worketh but in vain. Verse 2. He says, it is vain for you to rise up early and to sleep late. To sit up late. To eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. That means that the moment you see the subject of wealth in the kingdom as my personal achievement... You have lost the support of God. So when people look at you and say, how come at age 21, you are a multi-millionaire and you love Jesus? You will let them know that God is the one who lifts, God is the one who blesses, and that you have been trusted with it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. If then you have agreed that you are a steward and not an owner, the Bible gives us an instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, let a man so account of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. Let a man so account of us. It says, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The instruction is in verse 2. It says, moreover, it is required in stewards, ministerial stewards, financial stewards, parents, anything that has to do with being trusted with and anything from God. 
it says that a man be found faithful this is very powerful faithfulness is what god is looking for when you know i am not an owner that it only wealth and abundance you know people send me all kinds of text messages and they say apostle look at the marvelous thing god is doing you know and sometimes they say marvelous thing you are doing all across i'm very quick to correct them no man can do these things except god be with him there are things men cannot do truly whoever you want to lift lord you can lift through me whoever you want to bless lord you can bless through me whatever you want to do lord you can do through me whatever you want to say Lord, you can say. That is the mentality of one who is ready to be used to do marvelous things. In as much as I'm teaching on finance, I want you to know that this is truth that is applicable across every area of your life. That I may decrease, he says, that you may increase. So when they look at you and see Jesus, you are ready to really, really, really be trusted with great things in this kingdom. All blessings come from God and belong to God. All blessings come from God through men to men. Wealth and abundance in this kingdom is not an achievement. It is a trust from God. While others are clapping and, and listing their crowns and their achievements, you stand back with every sense of responsibility and you say lord thank you you are the one who has done this and i return the glory to you have we gotten it so far now the last thing i will talk about at least for tonight so that we can find somewhere to stop i want to now teach on the laws the laws of wealth and abundance the kingdom is built on laws a law refers to a modus operandi a system of operation listen to me the kingdom of god is systemic in its operation there is a governmental system there is how god administers power in this kingdom for instance in this kingdom the name that has been given that brings salvation and captures all authority is the name of jesus not jesus and joshua selman not jesus and preacher so the system for the administration of power in this kingdom in as much as it is through the ministry of the holy spirit but that power is from god there is no other name under heaven given to men the bible says by which we must be saved Wherefore God had so highly exalted him and given him a name, an office that is above every other name. So if you want to walk in authority in this kingdom, you must understand the system of administering the power of God. There is also an economic system in this kingdom. And it is based on laws. Laws. Laws represent the modus operandi. There is a way, there is a system for operating this mic. If I off it, I have violated the system that makes it amplify my voice. When you understand this, you will know truly, like Dr. Miles Monroe would say, that failure is predictable and wealth in the kingdom is also predictable. So, please pay attention as I just bring a balance and then share one or two things and we'll pray. If God has blessed you so far, please shout Amen. amen. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, for a very long time there has been a conflict in the body of Christ as to what the real keys for prosperity is in the kingdom. All of these things are preliminaries. They are foundations just trying to bring our thoughts to a level playing ground where we now begin to discuss the principles in, uh, properly. Businessmen and men of God have had, or spiritual leaders generally, and businessmen have had a conflict for a very long time as to what the real ingredients that must be captured in the life of an individual are for that person to prosper. 
On one hand, we have spiritual leaders, in this case, men and women of God. And largely, what we teach are spiritual principles, like tithing, giving, etc. And most times, we have taught these principles as the only principle that is needed for the prosperity of the saints. It doesn't mean the communicators are wrong people. They are just incomplete in their knowledge. And sadly, you know, we men of God, sometimes in the body of Christ, we struggle with a lot of pride. Everybody wants to claim he knows everything. And even in the midst of obvious ignorance, we will still insist that we know what we are saying. Are we together? So, here is a man of God, Joshua Selman, teaching that there are only the spiritual principles, nothing else. So, bring your type, give and etc. The moment you do that, you must be blessed. That is a very well-meaning statement, but I stand by the authority of Scripture and from the wisdom of men and women with proven track records to tell you it is not true. It is a foundational truth, but it is not all there is. Follow me to the other side where we have businessmen, graduates from Yale, Oxford, Harvard, Stanford Business School, and all men and women, veterans in business who stand and listen to us and say, don't trust those people. They are scammers. They are teaching you nonsense. And they say, now let me teach you. Forget about God. You don't need to prosper. After all, there are many people who did not prosper. Just focus on other things like productivity, value, and that's it. And you do all of that, and just before your money comes, the devil will kill you. Are you seeing this now? So you got all the knowledge and you ignored the spiritual leaders because they are speaking nonsense, so they taught you. And then you focus, and just when you need to go and check in the bank, you get up and your leg does not move again. You get up and you cannot think again. They ask you, who is your name? Your wife says, how are you? My husband, he said, I don't know who you are. And you are wondering what is wrong. And they diagnose you in the hospital and they say you are absolutely healthy based on what the machine is saying. Are you seeing it now? So who is wrong? Who might be wrong in this case? The answer is both. Both are wrong in that they have refused to embrace one another as systems of completion. Are you seeing now? So, the spiritual laws of wealth and abundance are potent, but not the only laws. The business or you call them physical laws of wealth and abundance they teach them as though they are a dichotomy so if you want to do god thing come to church and learn giving if you now want to make sense and forget this superstition and build something that works leave church and settle no the bible does not teach that can i tell you both these physical laws and the spiritual laws all together as i teach the school of ministry students they are called kingdom laws they are two sides of the same coin so, when it has to do with the laws of the kingdom, there are therefore two dimensions to it. There are the spiritual laws that govern wealth and abundance. Non-negotiable. In order of priority, they come first. But there are also physical laws of wealth and abundance. We'll take that in the part two. But today, I'll just talk a bit about the spiritual laws within the next 15 minutes or thereabout that we have. And then, we're going to pray. Please, I want you to pay attention. These are potent laws. They are irrefutable. Backed up by God's own jealousy. They do not fail. Hallelujah. They do not fail. Please pray in the Spirit in one minute and say, Lord, open my eyes. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. In the name of Jesus, open my eyes. Light of the world. You step down to my darkness, open my eyes, let me see. You're the light of my life, you step down into darkness, open my eyes and let me see. That really is the prayer. Will you open my eyes, let me see. Will you open my eyes? Psalm 112, what discussing the laws of kingdom wealth and abundance, it says, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Psalm 112, 112. Psalm 112, 
from verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that sheared the Lord, that delighted greatly in his commands. Verse 2 says, his seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Next verse. It says, wealth and riches. Say amen. amen. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. He didn't say he will look for it. They will be in his house and yet his righteousness will still endure forever. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 is the scripture that the devil has used for many years to punish believers. This scripture has been greatly manipulated. It has been used by well-meaning, sincere preachers, sincere people as a way of discouraging people from having any passion for financial resources misquoted largely and then misinterpreted the bible says here for the love of money please look up for the love of money is the root of all evil do you know what this means that lust for money is the strengthener of every kind of evil desire that means every evil desire is weak when it collides with money it can be strengthened do you know what this means that means money helps to reveal the heart condition of a man. If a man is wicked, money can strengthen wickedness. This is what he's saying here. That money is the root. The root. The root means where it gets its nutrient and strength from. The love of money, it says, not money. The word love there is the Greek word that is translated eros. Eros means an ungodly affinity. An ungodly affinity, a desire that is inordinate, a desire that is not scriptural. This is what the Bible says is the root of all evil. That when you have an obsession for money to the point where nothing else matters, not even the purposes of God, you get to a point where you can kill, you can steal, you can destroy for money. He's saying you are in trouble. But the Bible never said money is the root of all evil. In fact, if anything, the Bible says money, answer it. The all thing there is within the context of what you were saying. There are things I can tell you money cannot do. Are we together? So the kingdom is built on laws. We have the spiritual laws of wealth and abundance. And we have the physical laws. Please do not forget. We have the spiritual laws of wealth and abundance. And we have the physical laws. For this part of our discussion, as we attempt to conclude, let's deal with the spiritual laws. I will just touch on them. I'm sure in another series, God will grant us grace to go in depth. But this is generally to bring awareness to our hearts. You get the glory. You get the praise. Because someone's life is changing. You take the honor. I just want to say thank you. You get the glory, you get the praise, you take the honor, I just want to say thanks, so in my life, in my life, be glorified, be glorified. Are you ready for the first law? Hmm. The first law, whatever you don't understand, just be patient. Don't criticize, just be patient. For a very long time in the body of Christ, we have taught that the foundational law, foundational spiritual law, others have said tithing, others have said giving, others have said whatever, in order of priority. None of the aforementioned is the first law. The first law, the first spiritual law of wealth and abundance, write it down, is called the law of absolute surrender. The first spiritual law that governs wealth and abundance is called the law of absolute surrender. The law of absolute surrender hmm. the law of absolute surrender 
Job chapter 22, please. We'll start from verse 21. Job chapter 22. It says, acquaint now thyself with him, not with it, not with them, not businesses, and be at peace. Thereby, good shall come to you. Next verse. It says, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in your heart. He's teaching you how to prosper, and he's not mentioning any business. He's talking about the state of your heart. Down to 26, we're reading 26, 23 now. It says, if thou shalt return to the Almighty, ah, to prosper, I thought you didn't need God. Job is teaching us a principle here. If thou shalt return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, and thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacle. 24. Then thou shalt lay up gold as dust, and the gold of offer as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy defense, because when you prosper, you will have enemies. And thou shalt have plenty of silver, for then shall thou have thy delight. What? In your wealth? Your delight will be in who? The Almighty. And shall lift up thy face unto God. That means even with the abundance, your face will still be stayed on Him. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26. The law of absolute surrender. My son, I don't need your tithe yet. I don't need your offering yet. I don't need any of those things from you. Don't remove your shoe and drop anything here. The first thing and the ultimate thing I need is not your business idea. Leave your brain, leave everything. What I need is your heart. My son, I don't trust you if your heart is still in your possession. Give me your heart. I know what money can do to you. You know, a lot of people say, I'm humble, based on what parameter? Who would have known that a little shepherd boy one day would kill somebody? Can I be very honest with you? Until God vets the state of your heart and concludes, don't trust whatever you think your heart tells you. The Bible says the heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. Who would have known that a young boy would ignore his mother who gave birth to him one day simply because he has now become rich? Who would have believed that a young boy one day can stand and actually go and kill a human being and turn him upside down and drain the blood into a pot because he wants to make money? Can I tell you, the heart of man is dangerous. Until God vets you, you are not ready to do business with him. Very honest truth. The law of absolute surrender. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, speaking about the Macedonian church, it is true that Paul blessed them and all of that, but listen, he says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but they first gave of their own selves to the Lord. Can you see that there? The first thing they gave was their selves to the Lord and then unto us by the will of God before their substance. I submit to you by the authority of scripture that there are many people who are merely doing flesh-driven transactions in church. Most of our givings are not potent because they come from a heart that is not surrendered to him. Just because you are dancing with offering, it doesn't matter whether it's offering, whether it's a goat, whether it's a bag of it doesn't matter in what fashion it comes. If God does not have your heart, believe me, you are not ready to prosper God's way. The law of absolute surrender. I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm yours forever. I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm yours, my life is yours, it's yours, it's yours forever, it's yours, it's yours, it's yours, whatever you ask of me, whatever you ask of me, I surrender. 
I have prayed many times and even as I'm on this stage now, as, as a man of God, I am praying it. That if there is anything God gives me that I cannot give him back, my prayer request is that may it never come to me. Don't say amen for me, I'm praying to God. You pray your own prayer and, and, and tell God and say, Lord, if you are going to give me a car, a house, an estate, an oil well, doesn't matter what it is. If it would take your heart away from God, take away your sanity and make you too arrogant. Anything that makes your knees too far from the ground is dangerous for you. If you started the journey with him on your knees, even after 10 years as a billionaire, let him find you on your knees. Whatever you ask. This is the part that is not taught in church. This is the part that is not taught in business seminars. Christian people stand, I don't mean to be sarcastic, but people just begin to teach about money and they just fuel the lust of people. You see a lot of people diving on cars because they want to claim it. Lie down on a car that you should be arrested. You lie down on somebody's car, telling lies, all this fake living is because people are not surrendered. People still borrow money, give narratives that are not there. I'm showing you the kingdom's way. With the dignity of kingdom integrity, you can give him everything. Everything. That estate belongs to you. That oil well belongs to you. That company belongs to you. And mean it from your heart. Can I tell you one thing I know about God? Anytime you tell God, I give you anything, get ready. He must test you. There are things you tell God, you say, okay, I understand. But there are other things he says, I'm coming. What did you say is my own? Mention them. If you say Isaac is my own, I'm coming. Just because I left you in chapter 12 and the rest, I'm coming. When we get to chapter 22, I will tell you, take now thy son. Don't tell me he's the only one I know. Take him to a mountain. And offer him as a bond offering. The Bible says Abraham got up early in the morning. This was his future. Can I tell you? You can drop a billion naira and yet not be surrendered. So I'm not even talking of money. I'm talking of a state where if everything leaves you and Jesus still remains, you still believe that you are valuable. Absolute surrender. If we do not teach this in church, I am telling you we are going to produce a crop of millionaires that will shock the kingdom negatively. Most of the people we think are humble are not humble. They are humbled, not humble. Why do you stand and talk foolishly when you don't have anything to defend what you are saying? So you keep quiet and look wise. But in the presence of economic empowerment, that's when you see the revelation of... There are people today, if they make as little as 10 million or 5 million or 1 million, they will not listen to anybody again. Including a man of God. Everybody lift your hands and say, lift your hands for what? Um, I dropped. You, you see that kind of thing? There are many families where you can easily know when money has come and when money has gone by the passion that is suddenly developed for devotions and prayer and all of this. You can know that there is trouble. There's one money that is hanging somewhere and everybody now, a fast is declared, people start praying. When that money arrives, nobody even knows that it has arrived. Everybody just ignores God. No. What God is teaching us tonight is very powerful. And I, 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 I plead with the body of Christ, let us once again respect the place of surrender. More than tithing. You can bring tithe like a bribe from a carnal standpoint that just seeks to use God as a ladder and climb. You have wasted your money. That thing is donation. Can I tell you, the tray that carries your tithe is the purity of your heart. Not the, what you are dropping here. There are people who become wealthy people. You see, this is why I have profound respect for people who are wealthy in the kingdom and love Jesus Christ. 
their heart and their, my regard and my respect for them has no bounds. There are people who will even go to Jesus like colleagues putting their hands in their pocket and say, I'm rich now. Come, talk to me. I need help. Answer me fast. I'm used to boys and orderlies around my life. Come and answer me. And Jesus says, this was not how you were. So what? I'm now blessed. Make up your mind and train everybody you know, yourself inclusive, to never be ashamed. Never be ashamed of surrendering everything to Him. It's true. When your heart belongs to Him, He can now trust you with anything and not be afraid. I was telling the school of ministry students that God is still looking for treasurers. His last official treasurer disappointed him. He's still looking for people to manage his money for him. It's easy for us to insult Judas and criticize Judas. But can I tell you the truth? Anybody who can trust you with money, truly, truly, you were a trustworthy person. At least at the moment. Out of all the 12 disciples, it was only Judas. Don't just criticize Judas. Study him. It's not easy to hold that kind of money and still be your... Don't people steal money in church? Don't people steal money in offering baskets? Don't people steal money in weddings? Where they, they write blank check and people pocket it and God is watching? Can I tell you, having access to tremendous financial resources and still having your mind sane is profound stability. Profound stability. Next time you see a wealthy man who you know is wealthy by God and still has his mind, his sense of decorum, respect, discipline, sanity, don't just pray for that person. That person deserves your honor. Because I can tell you, this money thing has its own power. For Jesus to say you can choose only two options, either serve God or serve money. He didn't say serve Satan. Many people have disappointed God with this finance thing. God wants you to be exempted from that. There are many of us God has trusted with certain levels of things. You were loving God and worshipping Him. You were a worker in church. The moment you became wealthy. This was the foolishness of Solomon. He got to a point where he forgot the God of his father. When he now increased and he had many. Look at his confession in Ecclesiastes. He said, everything my eyes saw that I want, I got. What sort of a man is that? And he said, here is the conclusion of reading many books, there is no end. And much study is only a weariness to the soul. This is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands, for this is the whole duty of man. Vanity upon vanity, he said. All is vanity. Are we together now? This spiritual law, absolute surrender. You can put your checkbook on the ground, put your ATM cards on the ground, put all the papers of your assets on the ground, and lie down above them and say, Father, you are exalted above it too. Above it too. And the devil says, don't fall your hand. Don't forget that you are such a great man. And you say, no, I'm great because I'm able to lie down and worship. What was Satan looking for? Not money. He said, can you bow down and worship me? And I will give you this. If you can find my message, please go on our YouTube page, Koinonia Global. Follow my message, even as thy soul prospereth. I love him with my heart. And I continue to pray that he will grant me grace. That all these little, little increases that we're experiencing here and there, that God will grant us grace to still love him and remain and love him passionately. That the first thing that we communicate to our world is not our skill, our gift, our prowess, but our heart for God. I cast my crown before the highest royalty. I am undone before your glorious majesty. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the King 
crown when you become an elder it was not the young men that casted their crowns the bible says the 20 and 4 elders whatever made them an elder we know that an elder is one who has cheated time an elder is one who has put wisdom in time added experience in time added a legacy in time Tell you, I have still not found a reason to stop tithing. I have examined the thoughts across boards. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. The reason why people argue about tithe is number one, because they think tithe is about money. Tithe is not about money. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. This has nothing to do with a dispensation, this is an ordinance. Let me submit to you. There are two reasons why I think the tithe issue has become a controversy in the body of Christ. Number one, and is because of the way we men of God drum it. We drum it because we need the money and because there have been a, a lot of misuse and extravagance with God's money. People have played all kinds of games with God's money at the expense of people's sacrifices. And not everybody in church... Uh, people, God's people are not dummies. When they watch and they see that the value you are, pro you are producing does not match the kind of affluence and extravagance you are communicating, someone will be sensitive enough to ask questions. And because a tithe is a tenth portion, there is nothing to hide about tithe. Tithe, financially speaking, is a tenth portion of what you bring. And let me tell you, if that is combined from faithful people, it is a lot. Bankers, am I right? It is a lot. What is there to hide? Tithe was supposed to be a mechanism. Listen to me. According to scripture, the tithe was supposed to be a mechanism to cater for priesthood and to cater for the building of the Lord's house. To cater for priesthood. Remember, there was a time when the children of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are we Bible students, that while they were boiling the meat, they were given the privilege of using a fork to pick without looking. The scene there became when they now started opening the whole pot and they would look for the choice part of the meat and use it. And God said, no, this is not. I gave you the privilege to at least pick something. 
Now, there are all kinds of policies and principles. I'm not going into the legalities of ministries and Christian organizations and all of that. But I can tell you it is because of the annoyance of people from the carelessness, the recklessness, and the misuse of God's money. This is what has led people into this anger that has evolved into this campaign. There are a few people who have intelligently studied and based on their conclusion, they feel this is not needed. But I tell you, the root of most of this tight problem has come because of an, a, a level of integrity that has not been effectively communicated. Are we together? But I submit to you, and as far as it is within the jurisdiction of this spiritual family, I can tell you, be a faithful tither. Tithe is a tenth portion according to scripture one tenth now i know that a lot of people have taught to bring 50 percent of your tithe 80 percent of your tithe the bible does not say that if god tells you personally it is a personalized dealing don't create a doctrine out of it and punish people within the boundary of contentment and vision 10 percent of what god's people bring should be sufficient to run the activities of the ministry within the boundary of contentment, vision, and integrity. Are we learning? Yes, sir. So let me encourage you, based on the truth of scripture I have learned, based on the experience of veterans who have, been, who have truly prospered by God, I can tell you, do not stop tithing. If you don't have the revelation, settle down and get the revelation. Don't do it religiously. But as far as this house is concerned, as a ministry, we are a titan ministry. As an individual, I'm a titan person. And I can tell you, tithe is not about money. It is called the law of open heavens. According to Malachi chapter 3, when you begin to read from verse 8, it says, will a man rob God? It says, but ye say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. So the Bible is talking about robbery here. It says, ye are cursed with a curse. This is not the curse of the law. No. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10. It says, bring ye how many? All the tithes into my storehouse. In another series, we'll have the time to discuss what storehouse is because there are three platforms that qualify to be called a storehouse in fact i think i should just say it in one minute number one a storehouse means your place of primary spiritual nourishment it qualifies it is the first biblical platform that is called a storehouse your place of primary spiritual nourishment number two a storehouse also refers to any ministry that is committed to the salvation of souls and the transformation of lives. These two things must be there. If it is not actively committed to the salvation of souls and the equipping of the saints, it does not qualify to be called a storehouse. It's an uncomfortable truth, but this is the truth. And then number three, the storehouse can also by extension refer to an individual, a minister who is committed to the salvation of souls and the equipping of the saints. There are conditions where an individual can be regarded as a storehouse. These are the three. Just take it like this for now. In another series, as God grants us grace, we'll open deeper into this. I just didn't want to leave that gray area. But it says, bring ye all the tithe into my storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now, here which said the Lord. There are seven prophetic blessings according to scripture here that follow the title. Number one, God will open for you the windows of heaven. Number two, you will, you will pour out a blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Fathers like Kenneth Copeland will call it concepts, insights, and ideas. Next verse, it says, I will rebuke the devourer. The third, the devourer is a waster that comes to bring all kinds of waste on legal basis to your life number four he says he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground your ground is anywhere you plant can be your business can be your life and then number five he said neither shall your vine cast its young before its time number six he says you shall be called you shall be a delight some land please go to um all nations shall call you blessed verse 12 and ye shall be a delightsome land. Seven prophetic blessings according to scripture. 
when Jesus was rebuking the scribes and Pharisees for their being hypocritical, he did not negate the subject of tithing. He said, you tithe and you do all of these things and you negate the weightier matter. So Jesus identified this as part of the things that the believers should know. Tithe is very important. Number three. So number one is the law of absolute surrender. Number two is the law of the tithe. And then number three is called the law of giving. You can put in bracket the law of seed time and harvest. These are the three spiritual laws principally. Now under the law of seed time and harvest, there are so many, I don't want to run into it this night. But then it's sufficient for you to know that the law of giving, the law of seed time and harvest is a foundational spiritual law. Are we together now? Very important. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, we read it earlier. Here's what it says. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. So the Bible states clearly here that when you give, it shall be given unto you. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, we're rushing for time. This was Noah after the flood and a proclamation came from heaven on account of the sacrifice that he read. It says, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease this is an ordinance that will last while the earth remains that means anytime you don't find the earth stop obeying the law but provided you can see the earth you should know the law is in force what is seed time and harvest it means that the economic system of the kingdom runs on the principle of seed time and harvest spiritually speaking that anything you do not have it is because you did not plant the seed for it and seed here does not mean money if you want a harvest of kindness sow the seed of kindness if you want there are seeds and their corresponding harvests honor listen carefully Honor is the seed for a harvest called access. Good understanding is the seed for a harvest called favor. Diligence, listen carefully, is the seed for what we call lifting. So it is about understanding seeds and harvest. A question is the seed for an answer. Knowledge and wisdom are the keys for enlightenment. Are we together now? There are different kinds of giving. The Bible now switches to let us know that giving and receiving is sowing and reaping. That in this kingdom, every time you give, you are a farmer who is sowing. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll start from verse 6. So we've identified the fact that the Bible talks about giving and receiving. It says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully go ahead seven it says every man here is the condition and this is the cure for manipulation and control in the church every man according as he has purposed in his heart so let him give not grudgingly nor of necessity for god loves a cheerful giver verse eight and god by reason of your sowing have you seen that he's talking about sowing and reaping? Now he turns to giving and receiving. So in the kingdom, one of the ways that we sow is by giving. One of the ways that we reap is by receiving. He says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, so that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. Can I be honest with you? Ask anybody who God has lifted in the kingdom. If you do not engage the law of giving and receiving, there is a limit. In fact, you may not be able to rise to certain realms. Now, there are different kinds of givings with different levels of harvest allocated to them. Let me just run down. I may not have the time to explain them. Our time is already spent. Forgive me. We have what we call the worship offering. According to Deuteronomy 16, 16, the Bible says to not come before him empty. I'm trying to run very quickly. So there is what we call the worship offering. That when you come before God, it is not a compulsion. It's out of revelation that you should not come to the house of God empty. Based on revelation as proof of your love for him. 
So there is the worship offering. Number two, there is what we call kingdom investments. This is one of the major giving platforms that fulfills the spiritual law of wealth and abundance. Haggai chapter 1, I believe. Am I right on that? Yes. When you read from verse 2 and 3, Haggai, the prophet was speaking, chapter 1 from verse 2 and 3. He says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, These people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Verse 3. He says, Am I right on that? Verse 3. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Aha, uh-huh, next verse, let's see. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Kingdom investment. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He says, ye have sown much and bring in little. This is the result. Ye eat but have not enough. Ye drink but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you but there is none warm. And he that earned wages, only earned wages to put it into a bag that has holes. What is the message here? That your, your participation in the Lord's work, you shouldn't wait until there is a call. By the way, there is absolutely nothing wrong in calling people to give, provided the needs are clear, the revelation is there, and it is done within the boundary of integrity. The key word always is integrity. Are we together? There is nothing wrong with a man. I have gone to many places to preach and the people have come together and raised an offering to honor me and I have blessed them and prayed even in my secret place that God will bless them. There are times that the, the, the Lord, a church can agree together and put resources together and say, look, come and so. We've done this as a ministry and I'm sure that we'll still do it as the days come. Soon we're going to be looking at our building project and God will grant us that grace. So there is nothing wrong. The key word is integrity. And truth. Are we blessed? Kingdom investments. There are others like seed faith. Connecting your seed and your, your faith through a seed for a desired expectation. is based on the principle of resurrection. The Bible says that every seed can die. And that not only do you reap what you sow. God is able to give your seed another body. You can sow shame and reap joy. You can use your seed to kill negative seasons in your life. I have taught this. The principle of seed faith is based on the principle of resurrection. The same way the old heaven and the old earth can pass away, you can use a seed and take a season that you don't like out of your life. You can tie it by faith. This is why it is dangerous to steal money in church. Because that money you see is only a tray. There are people putting courses on it, putting all kinds of yoke seasons that they want out of their life. When you steal money from church, you don't allow the seed to die. Ask Gehazi and Naaman. Just because leprosy left Naaman did not mean it went away. It was waiting. And a man used a seed to bring it back to his life. I have used this as a principle. There are many people who have used the principle of seed faith. There are others like prophet offering. When I said it during the school of ministry, the students were laughing. Prophet's offering. Because that one has brought a lot of trouble. You know, we men of God, sometimes because we need money, we drum the issue of prophet offering. But the truth is that prophet offering is true. You can actually use a seed ethically. Uh, I, I wish I'm not the one who has to say this. But generally, according to scripture, you should not really go to meet a man empty-handed. It is scriptural, but it's just that those who have taught it, have taught it, with they've robbed in all kinds of biases that makes it to look untrue. But it is true. As much as possible, it's a kingdom culture you should learn. Especially a man of God who has labored obviously in word and doctrine. As much as possible. This is not to make you uncomfortable in any way here. But I am telling you, I owe you to teach you the truth. I have never gone to meet any man of God. In fact, in principle, it is not my culture to meet people and not sow into their lives. Then there is sowing to parents, both spiritual and physical, that attracts patriarchal blessings. These are different levels of giving. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother in the Lord, that your days may be long and that it shall be well with you. These are principles. There is the principle of first fruit. 
that has largely been misunderstood in, in many circles, respectfully speaking. But I believe that principle is valid. And again, within the boundary of revelation and truth, that principle can be engaged. There are many others. Sacrifice, vows. So all of these are there. But let me tell you, there are three that I know by revelation and by scripture that are directly related to the lifting of men. One is kingdom investments. Being act, an active participant in the work of the kingdom. Number two, prophet offering. If done with revelation and understanding, you can sow into an anointing that will lift you in a way that will surprise you. God gave gifts to men. And these gifts did not come empty. And then number three, seed faith. Where you can tie an expectation to end seasons and open others. These three I have practiced in my life and have revealed to many who have practiced. This ministry has practiced this. Kingdom investments, prophets offering, and seed faith. Lend me five minutes. Let's wrap up. Please write this. The return channels. There are return channels. When you practice the spiritual laws of wealth and abundance, certain things begin to happen in your life. There are three principal ways that God answers to you as touching your obedience to spiritual laws. Three return channels. Are you ready? Number one, favor with God and men. This is the first return channel to the saints. If and when they practice this, favor is powerful. The proof of favor is not just money. The proof of favor is access to the hearts of kings. Access to the hearts of men. Favor is programmable. Number two, wisdom. The second return channel that comes to you on account of activating these spiritual laws. Ah, my God. Somebody's life is changing. Oh, 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 this is the song you will start singing, you know. Because, listen. The kind of favor that will come. Next, when it starts coming, don't tell lies and say you don't know what you did. It is explainable. Hmm. Hmm. The songs of joy. So, the first return channel, favor. What is favor? Men willing to participate in your success. Men. Ah, every time men wait for my teaching, the gift of men. Oh, I have it. There's a teaching that is coming. The Bible says, what is man that you are mindful of? Here's how I read that scripture. What is in man? What did you hide in man that men are not seeing? What did you hide in man? Opportunities. What did you hide in man? Anointings. What did you hide in man? Track records. It's all hidden in man. Please do not downplay the place of favor. Every time you touch your pocket and you see money, generally speaking, there are only two ways money comes into your hand. Favor and value. We are coming there. Only. The favor of God is powerful. You can sleep in the prison one night and wake up a prime minister because favor was upon you. Can I tell you, many of us who are trusting God for land and structural establishment, above and beyond savings, it is the favor of God that gives men land. Psalms 44 verse 3. I can tell you, God can favor you into establishment read with me if you are a christian one to go for they got not the land in possession by their own sword neither did their own arm save them but thy right hand and thine arm the light of thy countenance why because thou hadst a favor unto them 
when favor is upon you the only person who cannot bless you is a blind person because the moment they can see you is a charm like force of attraction that compels men to participate in your success believe me i know what i'm saying esther chapter 2 and verse 15 b part says and esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her even the king verse 17 could not reject her the bible says the king loved esther above all the women she obtained grace and favor in his sight he set a royal crown on her hand and made her to be queen instead of Vashti. Exodus chapter 3 from verse 21. It has become an anthem here in Koinonia. May that work in your life. And I will give Joshua Selman favor in the sight of everyone in Abuja and Nigeria and anywhere. And it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty. Emptiness has an explanation. It means the favor of God is not at work in your life. You don't do bold face for favor. If it is not there, it is honestly not there. When favor is there, it speaks immediately. When the favor of God is on you, even a fish will swallow coin for your sake and come and bring it near you. Can a fish bite coin? But not when the master has need of it. Somebody will drop a donkey at the middle of the road and keep it for you there. Say, so lose that coat. If they ask you, say the master had need of it. A coat that no man had ridden. Why? Because he increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and with men. Number two is wisdom. Wisdom has five dimensions. But two of them are most important when it has to do with wealth. Divine direction and divine strategies. These are the dimension of wisdom required for wealth. If the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Elihu said in chapter 2 and verse 8 of Job, he said, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty maketh men of understanding. When you read Job chapter 29, the first four verses, Job began to give us the secret of his financial exploits. And he says, oh, that I was in the days of my youth. He says, when God preserved me, verse 3, he says, when his candle shined upon my head and when by his light i walked through darkness and now he begins to list all the things that happened to him the young men saw him and stood up the old men refrained from talking princes saw him they bowed everybody say wisdom the bible says wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom it says does not wisdom cry by me kings reign and princes decree justice the bible says with me are riches wealth and honor yea durable riches and righteousness there is a relationship between wisdom and wealth number three the third key is the blessing the blessing what the bible calls the blessing the activation of the blessing in your life Business people have called this all kinds of names. They've called it the law of attraction. They've called it all kinds of things. We call it in the kingdom, the blessing. The blessing is a very powerful spiritual quality that functions like a magnet. It has an assignment of attracting to your life people, opportunities, and resources. The blessing is a dimension of the operation of the Holy Spirit that rests upon a believer activated by engaging these principles the assignment to bring to your life listen to me if i throw nails here please look up we're wrapping up koinonia if i throw metallic nails here think how laborious it will be to pick all of them one by one all i need to do is to bring a serious magnet and just run it round. And every one of it will come. That magnetic property, men can exhibit it. Are we together now? Please believe what I'm telling you. That you can be in a city where it looks like everybody is a giver. It just depends on what is on you. The same person who will refuse to give you will carry one million and tell somebody, can I have the privilege of honoring you? So is that person greedy? It's just relative to what is on you. You can step into a city and every good thing begins to gravitate towards you. Again, resources, both human and material, 
opportunities. There are people, it's only when good things want to happen that you just suddenly find them there. They didn't just come there. There is a grace called the blessing. It draws them there. Are we together? And this is what is coming on someone. Just, you sat down in this. It's not just a lecture you have been receiving, ladies and gentlemen. You will leave this place and suddenly someone who did not call you for three, four years. You see 20 missed calls and you are wondering why. Don't, no, I'm giving perspective to your experiences so that you don't just thank God in ignorance. You know the name of what happened to you. Then you can help others grow too. Can I be honest with you? I prayed these things in my life because I knew that without these things, ministry will be, it will be as if God didn't send you. You know what it means to do ministry in this city. Without this revelation, you are in trouble. Except if you want to serve Satan or go to an idol. Apostle, I came from a background where no one has risen in our family, economically speaking. We all love Jesus, but it looks like nothing seems to happen. I bring you a word of hope. In this kingdom, we know that there is hope for a tree. What I've taught you now has nothing to do with being a preacher, being a businessman. We have not even this. You see that we've not mentioned anything business. Let me tell you this. When you engage, the spiritual laws of wealth and abundance are responsible for the arrival of financial resources in your life. Then the physical laws of wealth and abundance are responsible for the management and the multiplication of financial resources are you seeing the roles that they play when you are looking for financial resources it is engaging the spiritual laws that bring them to your life then when they now come if the only thing you know are the spiritual laws you will keep having momentary breakthroughs one testimony and then you have another one next year everything god gives gives man he gives he simulates that operation and plants in it the principle for continuity. It is called the ability to replenish. You cannot be wealthy if you are only fruitful. You must sustain the ability to replenish. Hallelujah. Please hear me. You may have come from a background where the whole family was in a room with rain leaking. And yet in your dreams and your visions, you see yourself standing before nations, feeding nations, funding the work of the kingdom, building churches single-handedly. The way out is not just to do business. Before business, the way out is not just investments. Believe me when I tell you this. The way out is not just a job. The first principle is this revelation. All wealth comes from God and belongs to Him. All wealth comes from God. It will reach me from men or through men to me. And that the wealth and the abundance in this kingdom, I'm only given stewardship over it. Therefore, I remain humble and grateful. And then you understand that the kingdom is founded on laws, not superstition. This is where Africa keeps getting cheated. Does God perform miracles? I believe that absolutely. Does God perform financial miracles? Absolutely. But he has set in motion a principle and tied it to the earth. It will not change. Absolute surrender. The law of the tithe, the law of open heavens, the law of giving, and you release this tree. Favor comes for you. Wisdom comes for you. The blessing that is already upon you is activated through your obedience to these laws. And all of a sudden, financial resources begin to come to you. One man coming as sent by God can hold your hands. And you can climb a ladder that took people 10 years, literally, in one day. It took 430 years to be in captivity. But ladies and gentlemen, it did not even take up to one day. That night, could not the king sleep. And then... He drove them out and gave them gold and gave them silver and gave them everything. They left with joy and honor and dignity. 
How about Mordecai? That night could not King Ahasuerus sleep. And he said, bring me the chronicles. When they opened it, who is in the chamber there? And it was that beast called Haman. He said, what should be done to slow a, a, such a man? And Haman thought he was himself. So he gave the best recommendation. God knows how to lift you. Yours is to trust him and just to obey. Please rise up on your feet. Please rise up on your feet. Participate in this prayer for the next two minutes. You're on your way to better days. You're on your way to better days. It's a prophetic word for someone. You're on your way to better days. Regardless your background. You're on your way to better days. Status is changing. No more decline. You're on your way to better days. Prophesy in one minute to yourself. Status is changing. No more decline. You're on your way to better days. I'm on my way. On my way. On my way to better days. There's only one prayer point for tonight. And then I make the altar call and we're done. One prayer point. Now that ye know these things, happy are you if you do them. Please lift your voice and obtain the grace to do. 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 Are you praying? The grace to do. Shalika parus katebelekata. Shande malas katebahasko prandikatala. The grace to do. All the overflows. Are you praying? Following online. Are you praying? I obtain the grace. To study this afresh. The grace to understand. Indeed in this season. In addition to all that he's given me. He grants unto me the power to get well. Through knowledge. Through sound exegesis of the truth. Someone is praying. Days of delay come to an end. Days of financial retrogression come to an end. Regardless my background, regardless my past. I find a new path to a glorious destiny. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Please let me encourage you. Ensure that you listen to this message again. Go on all our social media platforms. All Koinonia Global. There's Koinonia Abuja. The media would project it so you can see it. If, by the way, if you've not connected to all our social media platforms, we're a family of faith. Why don't you do so? Connect and follow. you get updates. But then it gives you an opportunity. The full message will be available. If I were you, I would listen again and again. Again and again. Again and again. Faith comes by hearing. Believe me, there are many things you did not hear that you thought you heard. It is hearing. There is the hearing of awareness. But there is the hearing of faith. Where through my voice, the Holy Ghost now speaks to you. Are we together now? Yes. He called Samuel twice. The first time he thought it was Eli. But when he went back, Eli said, when he calls again, say, speak, Lord. You are here right now. And you are yet to truly hand over your life to Jesus. Please, let's minimize movement. Remember, the first spiritual law is the law of absolute surrender. It takes pride to believe you are in control of your life outside of the assistance of Jesus. He died as an act of his mercy to help us. There are many of us here, we come from families where we are yet to experience the hand of God. And whilst you heard me teach, the Holy Spirit began to convict you. To say it is time to make it right with Jesus for real. Even though I am teaching on finances, Jesus is speaking to you. Come my brother. 
I'm about to make the altar call and I'll count one to five. There are others who are saying, Apostle, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. Wherever you are, we have just a minute for you. you. All the overflows, you can just move to the front of your screens. We want to make this very fast. I will count one to five. Please boldly leave your seat and come and join this, my precious brother here. One. Let's celebrate them as they come. Come to Jesus. Jesus said, come unto me all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. Koinonia, is this the best you can do? Jesus is bringing people here. Come. Even in a financial series, it is even as your soul prospers. If your bank account prospers at the expense of your soul, you lost it. What shall it profit a man, the Bible declares, that he gained the whole world and loses his soul? Come. One more minute. One more minute. Run to Jesus. Win that war tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. And you who are following in your homes or wherever, this is the moment to make a decision for Jesus. You may have struggled and struggled. This is an opportunity to hand everything over to Jesus to receive his life in exchange for yours. It truly pays to love Jesus and then to serve him. These ones have come. They have stood right here publicly to declare that they need jesus i salute every one of you young and old together thank you for the courage to come stand before jesus may i request that you alongside all who have come out in the overflows and those following online please lift your right hand if you can high above your head to the heavens please say this after me say lord jesus tonight i have heard your word i have come before you to surrender everything I declare from tonight that you are my Savior, you are my Lord, and you are my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. I receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. From today and forever, I am a child of God. Amen. Father, thank you for this once. You have drawn them to yourself. May the grace that keeps, may that grace keep them. By the authority of scripture, I declare your sins forgiven. And I commend you to the ministry of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit for your establishment. You go from glory to glory. You go from grace to grace. Indeed, may this be a season where God will prosper and bless you. Even whilst you seek to love and serve and live for him. You are blessed. You remain blessed in Jesus' name. Now, please do me a favor. There is someone waving the, uh, his hands and the counselors are there. Please, all of you in concert, just move to our officials, our counselors. They will have a word with you in just a moment and you'll be back to your seat. Same with all the overflows. Let's celebrate them. Hallelujah. Have you been blessed tonight? Please let me encourage you. I know that many of us, you know. Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well that you will keep these words in the midst of your heart that no matter the circumstance your eyes are going to be fixed on these words and as you have been blessed we will tell you to share this message be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed and then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos we have loads of content that is going to make you blessed that is going to set you on course that is going to set you ablaze and don't forget to like for us thank you